Ezekiel, maybe, and Jeremiah, those. Keep going beyond those. If you get to Matthew, you're going too far. I was thinking this uh, uh, about, as I was thinking about a message for, I often like to speak on something concerning the country. And um, believe it or not, the story of Jonah, I think, has great ramifications to us in the United States today. And the reason why is because, I don't know about you, but I've often run into people that have said something like this. Our nation is too far down the road of moral collapse to ever be recovered. I don't know if you've heard that. It always bothers me. And I think the book of Jonah should give us great hope is we're going to walk through this book. Okay, we're just going to walk through the book. I'm going to show you just a couple major points out of each. And as we do so, when we get to the end, you're going to understand what a huge message that comes out of this that applies to you and I as individuals and applies to our country. So we started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the book of Jonah. We thank you for the being together that we can and find courage and find hope and find that you will guide us, Lord. May your spirit be our teacher. May you help me to emphasize what needs to be emphasized. Uh, Lord, may you hasten me on beyond those that don't need to be uh, discussed as much. So we just ask for grace and guidance on this and that you might be glorified. And Lord, teach us this, this day from your word, we pray, for we all come with different needs. Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray, that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now let's talk, first of all, about chapter 1. By the way, that's a map of the Mediterranean uh, area. And if you notice, and let's see, I think I can bring it up for you. Um, let's slide, let's see if I can. Eh. I'm not the greatest with this thing. I'll try it again. Um, this is the Assyrian Empire, okay? The dark green is the... Um, that's where it was in the, about 800 or so years before Christ. Uh, you'll notice the light green and how far it expanded. That was during their zenith of power. And you also may notice that there's a certain section, let's see if I can bring it up here, uh, a certain section that is kind of a different color. Did you see it? Uh, try one more time. It's right in there. It's Judah. The, the one country they didn't conquer. Now they had influence over them for a time. There was part of the time that they were a vassal for the Assyrian Empire under some weak leadership. But under Hezekiah, the, the Assyrians went home with their tail between their legs. And there's reasons for that. I won't get into that. It's not our purpose for today. But I will tell you this that Jonah is living when Assyria is on the march, they're growing. And for about 300 years, if you can imagine it, they were the big power on the block. Matter of fact, I was kind of reading this week. It was interesting to me. I didn't know this. And, and I know you can, but it is, it, I, I believe these historical sources were, 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 um, you know, were on the up and up. And they said that the Assyrians really, um, they kind of, uh, uh, how would you say it? They, they used in mass some of the military tactics that would be coming down the road, like a battering ram to break down cities. Um, they, were, they, they were known for their cruelty, and I'll show you some indications of that in a moment, so that they terrified people away from, from uh, rebelling against them. Okay? They were uh, like terrorists of the day. Um, they also... Um, uh, developed major used um, elsewhere and, and down through the ages ever since. So this was a, uh, an empire that was on the rise during the reign, uh, during Jonah's day. He's living, uh, looks around in the 700s, about the mid-700s, and um, that seems to be a roughly the time he's alive. Let's just start with verse 1, and I want you to notice... Uh, God's a clear call upon Jonah's life. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And Nineveh was one of the largest cities in the ancient world at that time. 
uh, may have had somewhere between 600,000 people. Possibly there's like a conglomerate of cities that were together. Could have been um, some, I, I was reading a little bit, that was indicating possibly a million people in this city. Um, and again, several kind of, almost if you think of New York, you've got Queens and you've got, um, you know, different um, sections. But um, this was a large, uh, very powerful city. And so God's clear call was to go to Nineveh to cry against it. Now, what do you think he means when he says cry against it? Yeah, you're announcing judgment upon it, okay? And God told them, the reason why I want you to do this is because their sin is great before me. Now, Jonah is, does not react well to this message from God. He's a prophet. His job is to do what God told him to do. It's to preach wherever God tells him to preach. But notice verse 4. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord and went down from Joppa, he put, um, went down to Joppa, he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it uh, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now again, if you're looking at that map, uh, Jonah is living on the, uh, the, the coast over here uh, toward Israel on the uh, edge of the green, on the edge of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. He is trying to go the opposite direction. Nineveh, a capital, is, is up uh, toward the kind of the, the northern section of the Assyrian Empire. And Jonah is trying to go the exact opposite direction uh, toward the uh, uh, area of Tarshish, kind of heading towards Spain. He's definitely rebellious against this um, command. Now, why is it? Here's a, here's a relief actually done by the Assyrians themselves. I'll show you the violence of these people. Um, can you see, for instance, what is up there? What are they holding up? They're holding up heads of the people they conquered. Again, known for the cruelty that they would have toward other nations. And Jonah is basically saying, I don't want to go. It's not, don't think that it's because he's afraid to go. That's not the issue. He doesn't want to go. Because he hates these people. And he knows, very possibly, we're not certain of this, but he might have known some prophecies of what God had said would happen to, to his country, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. Not Judah. He's living in the northern part of, of Israel, uh, called, uh, it's just called Israel at that time. Um, there have been two different prophets that live around Jonah's time. Here's what Amos would say. It's Amos chapter 5 and verse 27. He said that the people... His nation of Israel would be carried away beyond Damascus. It's Amos 5.27. Assyria was beyond Damascus. Um, now, what's also interesting is a prophecy that Hosea wrote. Um, let's see. Um, if you go two books toward the back from where you're at, just real quick. Um, uh, let's see. Jonah, Mike, and Nahum. Uh, I'm sorry. Hosea, Joel, Amos. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a little in front. It's in front of Jonah. Um, Hosea chapter uh, 10. Actually, let's see, is it 11 or 10? Let me look it up here. I think it's, it's 11, verse uh, 5. Yep. I'll start with verse 3. Hosea 11, starting with verse 3. Uh, God had made this prophecy through Hosea, and Hosea is living around Jonah's day. I taught Ephraim. That's the name for the northern kingdom, Jonah's country. I taught Ephraim also to go, to go talking uh, uh, them, uh, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. I was to them as, as they that take off the yoke of their jaws. I laid meat unto them. God is what he's talking about. He's saying when, 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 when the, the northern kingdom was young, he said, I was taking care of these people. When they're, they're my children. They're like my children. But notice verse 5. He, speaking of the northern kingdom where Jonah's, he's a citizen of that kingdom, he shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king. And Nineveh is the great city of the Assyrian empire. The Assyrian shall be his king because they refuse to return. The prophecies were that the Assyrian empire would eventually conquer Jonah's people. And when God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, Jonah doesn't want to go. 
That means God steps in with some serious discipline. Look at verse 4. Chapter 1 of Jonah and verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind unto the sea. There was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried everyone unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So this tremendous storm is going on uh, above the, uh, you know, where, where the ship is, is being tossed. But Jonah down in the bottom of the ship, it, it just seems like nothing's going on down there. So he's, he's asleep. Notice if you would, God exposing Jonah's sin. So the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil has come upon us. Now I want you to think about these are These are seasoned sailors, and they're saying, This is not a normal storm. Someone has made the gods, they probably don't know the true God, someone has made the gods angry. Verse, at the end of verse uh, 7, So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And they said, We pray thee, for whose cause is this evil upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? Of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. He says, I fear the God that created everything here. And the men were exceedingly afraid. And they said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For, he, for the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So in, in telling his story, Jonah tells them, I'm a prophet. I've run away from God. I'm disobeying God. And that's why this storm is here. And they're like, What did you do that for? Verse 11. And they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be common to us, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm to you, for I know that for, th for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Now think about that. What you've got going on here is there's only one reason for the storm, and that is they, they, the guys know this. They, they, they know this is not normal. This is not natural, and they realize it is the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, the creator of the whole thing. They also realize that the only cure for the storm is that Jonah is to be cast in the sea. And Jonah is the one that said this, and they don't want to believe this. Keep reading, verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord, and notice who they're crying to. Isn't that interesting? They now fear the God that Jonah's been talking to them about, even though he was disobedient. They cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life, and they not, lay not innocent blood upon us, innocent blood, O Lord, for thou hast done as it hath pleased thee. What they're saying is, we're going to do what this guy told us to do. We're going to throw him in. Don't be angry that we've done this. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Now they see the sea all of a sudden stop. Can you imagine what these guys are thinking? They've seen the power of God. They've seen the person of God, and the fact that this is the God that, that has been was the God of the, of, the, of the Red Sea crossing. That had gone around the, the, the Middle East. This was the God that, that, the, that, that people knew, the God of Israel. I'm telling you, the, the, the Jewish people were right in the crossroads where so many people traveled. God had them in that spot. And now they've encountered a situation where he's dealing with one of his servants. So notice, as the sea stops raging, verse 16, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. And verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great, great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God's swift discipline. Now, there's, there's a couple of things that, 
that um, are, are honestly um, questions that I have, as God has um, certainly judged Jonah publicly but saved his life. And let me just run some of those questions by him. By the way, this is a literal picture. Do you see what is in that picture? I saw that on Twitter. Somebody sent that to me just this week, and I had I, they didn't know I was going to preach on Jonah. But that, if I can bring it over to you, that's a whale. I'm going to back off. It's underneath that ship. Now look at how that's a that's a evidently a blue whale. You can see how that whale just dwarfs that little little vessel out there. I don't know what kind of creature it was. The Bible just calls it a, a, a fish. The swallow Jonah, but that's a massive, massive animal there underneath that ship. That's fascinating that they caught that. So I got some questions for you before we proceed. First of all, how did Jonah's fate look to the sailors? I can't guarantee this, but I got to wonder if they saw Jonah get swallowed. I don't know. Might be my guess that they saw him. But how? What are they thinking is going to happen to this guy? They think he's done. They think he's dead. As they're walking away, they're not thinking, okay, three days from now he's going to be okay. They don't know the story. They're thinking he's dead. Let me ask you this question. Do you think they told anybody else when they got to shore? Are you kidding me? You can't believe what just happened to us. And these guys are shaking up. We're on this, this storm that you can't believe the storm we were in. And this guy tells us he's a prophet of the God that made heaven and earth. And he tells us that he's been running from God and that's why that storm came. And we throw him overboard and the storm stopped. And then we saw this guy get swallowed by a whale. Let me ask you this one. Who, might the, you, who do you think these guys told? Now think about it. What, what's their job? They're sailors. Who are they probably going to tell? Other sailors. Right? As well as their family. I mean, I'm going home with the biggest fish tail that, uh, you know what I'm saying? They're probably going to tell other sailors, though, when they get to port, don't you think? So where, did Jonah tell why he was running? Did he? Go back to chapter 1, verse 10. Look at it again. Did Jonah tell them why he were running? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now, if he tells them the whole story, then what has he probably told them? I've been running because I didn't want to preach to Nineveh. So let me ask you this. Where might this account have gone? Because if you're telling sailors... What are they going to do? They're going to sail. Points on the Mediterranean. And that story literally could have gone across different spots in the Mediterranean within just a short period of time. Especially if these guys, and I don't blame them if they did this. I don't know that I'd have gone all the way to Tarsus at that point. I think I'd have found land, <laughs> done the Pope routine, you know, kiss the ground. And... Uh, Spend some time on shore before I head back out. And you got to wonder if the story of a man that was thrown overboard and assumed to be dead because he wouldn't preach to Nineveh, you wonder if it doesn't get back to Nineveh. Let's go to chapter 2, which is Jonah's repentance after God's discipline. Now, he's still in the, in the, in the fish right now. Verse 2, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and cried and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Do you think uh, by any chance that uh, uh, this prayer of Jonah uh, shows us that he was in some affliction? Okay. He says it would be like, in his mind, it'd be like being in the, in, in the word hell, there is Sheol, which is the realm of the dead. But notice he's praying. Verse 3, for thou hast cast me into the deep, 
In the midst of the seas, the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. I, then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. I will look ag- yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Jonah is saying, even though it seems that, God, I'm out of your sight, I'm still going to pray. This guy who has genuine faith. He's not living for God, but he's got genuine faith. Verse, th- verse 5. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed around about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. What does he mean, weeds wrapped around my head? Seaweed. Can you imagine the sickness of that? I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. That's how it seemed to him. That fish is diving at different times. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Those probably be the ribs. Thou hast brought me up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came unto thee into thine holy temple. Have you ever been there where you seem to be at the bottom? And Jonah is saying, but God, I know you hear me. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Now, some of your modern translations are going to actually render that, those that observe useless idols, maybe. I I really think what Jonah is saying, I'm going to stop lying to myself. This is not a happenstance. This is, uh, I've got to come and be honest. I'm here because of what I've done against God. Verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. You can't offer a, a... a physical sacrifice, but he said, I can give you thanks. You preserve my life. He says, I will pay that that I have vowed. I want you to think about that statement. Lord, I'm making you some promises. Now, he may be referring to promises that he had made when God uh, called him to be a prophet, that he would go anywhere and say anything that God wanted him to say. Or maybe he's saying, God, if you let me out of here, I will go to Nineveh. In either case, he's saying, I'm going to keep my word to you, God, and that will involve going to Nineveh. And then notice where he says, salvation is of the Lord. We see Jonah's prayer. Then we see God's response. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Well, God's response may have been messy, but it was effective because Jonah sincerely repented. Jonah was... (laughs) Not going to kick against God's will this time. And so God let him out. You know, um, it's interesting because it says the goodness of God leads you to repentance. That's what's happening here. Let's move on to chapter 3. Jonah's fulfillment of his promise. He promised God that if God would let him out, that he would actually uh, go to Nineveh, right? So let's see what happens. Chapter 3, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I give and bid thee. Same call. God didn't change his mind. But notice that Jonah is going to change his behavior. Verse 3. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. It took you three days to get, to get through it. Okay, if you're going to, you know, kind of weave your way... Uh, through the streets of it, very possibly. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, now notice his message, yet 40 days, and then Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now what do you notice about Jonah's message? It's a warning, right? Is that what you're saying, Keith? It's blunt, it's brief. Somebody else was saying something. Gave him a time period. Exactly right. 40 days. John. There's no, there's no if. There's no invitation. This is 40 days and this city's coming down. Rather terse message. Can I say that Jonah is keeping his word, but he is going through Nineveh without any compassion for these people? And I'll show you. I'm not just making that up. I'll show you that in a moment. No compassion for the people. And he has no, gives them no hope. But I have to wonder if the message of this prophet that was supposed to come to Nineveh 
and the storm that came up had gotten to the city itself before Jonah got there. And you also have to wonder this. If you've been three days in a whale's belly, what are you going to look like when you come out? I hope Jonah took a shower, at least bathed in the, in the sea, maybe. But what would that do to you? It would probably bleach you. If he didn't have white hair like mine, he probably had it when he got out. Very possibly his skin would have been blotched. And when that guy comes rolling into town, those people took him seriously. I don't know all the circumstances. I, I've, I've read that there was a plague that hit right around that time, a short a few years before that. They'd also had a, a, an eclipse that often terrorized the people in that region. Um, whenever it happened, because they didn't, they, those that didn't know the Lord didn't realize that this is not, they, they always looked at it as a bad omen, those who were pagans. And so Jonah is coming to town with this message, 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. We see God did not change his call, Jonah changed his behavior. We also see that the people of Nineveh changed their religion, and they did it all overnight. Now look what happens here. Verse 5. Chapter 3, so the people of Nineveh believed God. By the way, they worshipped, kind of interesting, the Ninevites, when we look back in ancient history, they worshipped two fish gods. Do you realize that? It's kind of interesting. They worshipped Dagon, who was half man and half fish. That's how they presented them. And they worshipped a, a, a goddess, and her name was Nanshe, N-A-N-S-H-E. She was a fish god or goddess, I don't think they're, they're, they're giving their gods credit for this because you'll notice they're crying unto God. They're crying to the one that made the storm, the one that, the one that uh, brought the fish in the first place. They're, the one, they're talking to the one that created heaven and earth. And they've got a lot of sins to confess. Verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 5 again. They called unto, they believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Now, what's this idea of fasting and sackcloth? Those are ancient ways of showing you're mourning and you're upset about sin. Sackcloth would be like feed, uh, you know, the old, uh, what's it called, burlap? Putting that on your skin. The idea is that you're, you're on purpose suffering so, um, so that you're showing a, a, a sorrow over what you've been, what you've done. Verse 6, For a word came unto the king of Nineveh. He hears about this prophet going through town. And he arose from his throne, laid his robe from him, covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king. And his noble saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way, from the violence that is in their hands. Now notice verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Jonah gave them no hope, but, but I will tell you, and, and this is true for you and it's true for me, and that is, even when God is pronouncing judgment, the very fact that he's warning you means he doesn't want to judge you. That's why he, that's why he went to such effort to get Jonah there. So the people did repent. They did put their faith in the one true God, admitted what they had done wrong, and you notice God changed his decree. Verse 10. And the Lord saw their works, that they repented of their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said he would do to them, and he did it not. And you almost wish you could close the book right there. Ooh. But that's not where it closed. So we come to chapter 4, and I want you to notice Jonah's, Jonah's anger with God's mercy. Verse 1. We'll notice in the first three verses some revelations about Jonah. 
It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. He was angry about what? That God would be merciful to the Ninevites. Would you be angry with God if he showed mercy to your best, to your worst enemy? Someone that's really done you evil. Jonah's really struggling with this. You notice he's, then, he's got some issues, doesn't he? First of all, we see a deep prejudice against the Ninevites. Now again, here's another of their... This, these are things that they carved. The Ninevites did. The, the, the Assyrians. Okay, The Nineveh is a major city. And I want to again point out here, this section right down here. Do you see it? Those are stacked heads of people that they conquered. If you move it over, you'll notice this guy is holding one uh, head above his, he's going to throw it on the stack. They're bragging about the murderous, cruel things. And, and, and believe me, I could show you other things that would, that, would, that would be, make you sick. The idea is simply this. These are wicked people. And Jonah has a deep hatred for them. An extreme prejudice against them. And notice verse 2. So we learn Jonah is, 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 uh, is a very prejudiced man. We learn something else. Look at verse 2. And he prayed. This is Jonah talking again to God. He prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarsus, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and great in kindness and repentest thee of the evil. He said, I knew God, you'd forgive him. That's why I didn't want to go. It wasn't that he was afraid to go to Nineveh. He didn't want them forgiven. If you knew, let's say our, our, our leading um, competitor militarily on the, on the world stage right now is China. If you knew that possibly in your lifetime, China was going to conquer the United States and enslave our people, and cart them off into all kinds of cruelties. And God said, I'm going to destroy them. How would you feel about that? Destroy them before they destroy us. Jonah doesn't want them forgiven. We see his prejudice. We see his, his reason for not wanting to go to Nineveh in the first place. We also see a, lot of, a bunch of things about God, though, here. And he's disgusted with God's mercy. Look at verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, I take, I, uh, take, I pray thee, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah says, I just, just end it for me, God. I don't even want to live. Because those wicked people, you've forgiven them. They're going to live on. And so we're going to learn some things about God. First of all, did you notice what Jonah said about God? That he knew about God? Back up there in verse 2. He said, I know you, Lord. You are gracious. Satan will slander that to you, but God is gracious. He said, you are merciful. You are slow to anger. And you are, you see that word of great kindness? Remember, we've been looking at the word that often is translated mercy for loyal love. You are great in loyal or steadfast love. That word kindness is that word again. Jonah said, I knew you'd forgive him, God. Now, we also notice some things about the Lord. God's way of working with his true servant, even though Jonah is a, is, is, is a guy with a bunch of sins in his life, he, is, he does know the Lord personally. God works with imperfect people. Is that okay with you? Is it? Sometimes. Sometimes we, you know, well, so-and-so goes to your church, don't they? Well, I know. Yeah. The church is not a wax museum where we show off how good we are. The church is a hospital. We come to get help. Do you, you get mad at the, the, the medical director because, oh, you got some sick people in your hospital. Do you know that? There's sick people down there. Well, duh, that's why they're there. Same thing with the church. Church is a hospital. It's where we come to get spiritual help. 
God's going to work with Jonah with some questions. Verse 4, Then the Lord said, Dost thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. So what's Jonah hoping? He's hoping they'll still be there 40 days from now. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll go back into sin or something. God can torch them. He's going to sit there until he finds out what's going to happen. And the Lord prepared a gourd. Now, you see that picture there? That's of, uh, that, I got that off the internet of, of a gourd. You can see there's some real wide uh, leaves on it. The Lord prepared a gourd. Verse 6, and it made it to co a cover over Jonah that he might sh be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. So he gets some shade from this. It's, it's, it's a really helpful. I'll keep him out of the sun. Verse 7, but God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. So the, you can see the old caterpillar comes in. Starts mowing down on the gourd without Jonah noticing it. And before he knows it, the gourd withers away. And Jonah's back in the sun again. It came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah. And this wind is, is blowing probably sand and all kinds of stuff. And um, you notice that he fainted and wished himself to die. And said, it is better for me to die than to live. And why is he so upset? Because the Ninevites are going to live. And God said to Jonah, he's, a sec, he's asked him the same question again, dost thou well to be angry? But now this time for the gourd. And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. I'm so upset about the gourd dying off. And that caterpillar that you let eat that thing, that I, I'm, I'm ready to die. Now here's God's lesson for his prophet. And, and then said the Lord, Hast thou pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Now think what God's saying. You got one gourd here, Jonah. You did nothing to create it. It didn't live very long. Came up in a night, going to perish a night, and you're all upset about the gourd. Verse 11. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand, that's 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle. Who created those 120,000 people? God did. Jonah, you're all upset about a gourd you didn't even create that's going to come up and, and die and it'll be gone. He's saying, God is saying, I created every one of those 120,000 people that can't tell the difference between their right hand and their left. Now, by the way, there's a couple ways of looking at that. He could be talking about merely the children of that city. It's very possible. Of a, of a city size of about 600,000, about a fifth of that would be children. That could be a possibility. The other possibility is, he's, is, is that that's the population of the city at that time. And what God is really saying is, look, these people don't know right from wrong. But God is saying this. It's not one gourd. It's 120,000 people. It's not something you never created. It's something that I created. And they're not, this is going to be gone and, and, and that's it. These people are going to live somewhere forever. And you want me just to snuff them out? Let's think about what this means. Number one, God demonstrated great desire to show mercy to a wicked nation, did he not? Think of the miracles that God did just to get Jonah there. Calls him. Clearly calls him. So Jonah knows he's supposed to go. Then when Jonah runs the other way, God sends the storm. Then he reveals the answer. Who in the world would say, come up with a, an idea like, throw me overboard? That's craziness. God clearly had to reveal to Jonah that's the only way to get out of this storm. Then there's the God-given stop of the storm as soon as Jonah gets in the water. 
Then there's the fish that's prepared specifically to swallow Jonah up, whether it's a normal fish or something unique. But to swallow him up at that moment so he doesn't drown. Then there's the three-day whale ride or whatever fish he's in. To preserve him through that. Then there's the deliverance that he burps him up, not in the middle of the ocean, he burps him up on shore or near the shore where he could crawl up. All of this just to get Jonah to Nineveh. And then not only that, but possibly, very possibly, word got to Nineveh before Jonah gets there. All this to save one city. Shows you something else. God demonstrated great desire to change his sinful servant's heart too, didn't he? He could have just let Jonah go, blow off smoke and just say, forget it, Jonah, you're nuts. He doesn't do that. He spends time working with him, asking him questions, giving him an example. An example that we still have to this day. Number three, God went to great lengths to save them, the people of Nineveh. People who would chop their enemies' heads off. And by the way, some of those things that I showed you were what the Ninevites did after Jonah's day. They didn't stay in repentance very long. Matter of fact, depending on when exactly, we're not sure exactly when Jonah lived. He lived during the reign of Jeroboam II. And Jeroboam lived about 40 years, or reigned about 40 years. We know that he was ministering during that time. So you get some parameters, but it could have been less than 50 years before the Ninevites are back doing their wicked deeds again, and they conquered Israel, Jonah's people, carted them off into slavery. The, the one stacking up the heads, that would be done in the 600s to the Mesopotamian people, probably mid-600s. God went to Great Lakes to save people like that. But I want you to think, let me back up for just a second, can you think of a greater example of God going to great lengths to save people. Can you think of a greater example than that? The only thing I can think of is the cross and the life of Christ. Let me give you some examples of that. The incarnation, the virgin birth. The incarnation is when God becomes a man. Explain that one to me. How God can become a man. That has twisted the minds of theologians for centuries. How about this one, the virgin birth? I can, I can trust God with that. That's not a big deal. God can create man. He can create life inside a, a woman's womb. womb. But, the, but the idea that God would go through that kind of effort. How about deliverance from Herod? Herod tried to kill Jesus when he was just a bit, an infant. Yeah, have you thought about when Jesus was delivered at Nazareth? The Bible says that they were going to take him to the top of the hill of his own hometown when he preached a message in their synagogue that they didn't like. And by the way, he was talking about how God would reach the Gentile. They still had problems with prejudice in Jesus' day. As a result of that message, they're carrying him to the top of, the, the, of, a, of a cliff area near the city of Nazareth. They're going to throw him down. The Bible says he just slipped out from their midst. He was also delivered miraculously in Jerusalem. Same idea, they were going to try to kill him there before the cross. Then, of course, all of his miraculous ministry that Jesus went through, healing the blind, raising the dead, lepers being cleansed, people with demonic possession being delivered, all of these things that Jesus was doing during his public ministry, and, of course, his resurrection. All of this, and by the way, all of these things that I'm mentioning to you are, are, yes, miraculous, but how about this one? You can read about them. We can read predictions of Jesus' uh, death. We can read predictions of his burial and his resurrection, all that were written hundreds of years before he came. We can read them today. And there's no doubt they were written before his, before his birth. They prophesied in the Old Testament that the, the fact that Jesus would come from the nation of Israel, that he would come from the tribe of Judah, that he would come from a specific family in the tribe of Judah called the family of David, that he would be virgin born was prophesied. Again, that he would be put to death for the sins of his people would be, was prophesied. All of this. Which means this. When people say, 
I think America's too far gone. I think we've done too many. We have sinned greatly against God. There's no doubt about that. But I believe this. If God would save the people of Nineveh, God would save us too. And I believe this. God wants to save and show mercy to you too. Because the Ninevites were just a bunch of single individual people living in the same area. What's also very interesting, if you read some, some of, the, of the thoughts about the book of Jonah and the overall message, Jonah was a prophet typically to his own people. And the amazing thing is that on, among his own people, they probably did not listen to him anywhere near as much as the Ninevites did with one particular trip through that city. A trip of a prophet who didn't even want them to repent. These people who had not heard grabbed it. And yet many of his own countrymen to whom he had a far greater love and burden would take the very prophecies of Jonah and throw them to the wind. What's the difference between God sparing the city of Nineveh and just a few years later delivering Jonah's nation to the Ninevites? And the bottom line was this. God could spare the people of Nineveh because they, they wanted to repent. And they chose to repent. But God's own people who heard his word repeatedly, repeatedly, chose not to repent. I ask you this. What are you going to do with God's word? I'm convinced God wants to spare our nation. As he would any other nation. Bottom line is this, God has gone to great lengths to show you mercy, but you must repent to receive it. You must be willing to humble yourself before him, like the Ninevites did, and say, God, I'm not worthy. If I get what I deserve, I'm, I'm going to be judged. I'm going to end up in hell. But you went through such effort to save me. You gave your life, your son's life for me. Put him to death in my place so I could be forgiven. You've ever doubted the fact that God would forgive you? If you've ever doubted as a Christian that God would restore you, look at the book of Jonah. The problem has never been with God. The problem is whether or not I will choose to repent and turn to him. Mercy is available. The very fact that God would warn you means he would forgive you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you when we think of the cross, when we think of how it's a demonstration of your love to us. You've told us that. Romans 5 eight. The effort that you went through so that we could be saved tells us that you want to show mercy. It cries out from the cross. It cries out through the book of Jonah. As Jonah was led to a, very, a group of, of, of very cruel and wicked people, but people that you loved, loved enough to put a, put a man through all kinds of harrowing events, so just to get him there. Oh Lord, I pray for any who may be here today. They may not know you as Lord and Savior. May they realize if they just look at the cross, they see the effort that God has gone through to provide a way for them to be saved. Oh, Lord, if a person's here and doesn't know you, I pray for their souls right now. I pray that they'd come to know you. And, Lord, for those who are Christians, maybe like Jonah, have, have gotten away from you. It's amazing how tenderly you dealt with this man and how you reached out to him. And very possibly, he might have written the book later on having received and understood the lessons you had for him. We don't know who wrote it. But I pray. I pray that we will take your instruction and realize, yes, you love us. You've gone out of your way to forgive us, to make us your children so I can be forgiven and restored. 
Lord, I pray for those, for our nation this morning. Lord, we have great sins against thee. And, and often on Wednesday nights, we, we pick just one and we begin to pray. Oh, Lord, we ask that you would overthrow the sins of our country. Certainly, we would pray for your mercy upon our land. And Lord, this book gives us hope that even with 40 days left, you spared the city of Nineveh. Oh, Lord, you could spare us again today. We ask that we would receive your mercy and repent and not throw the opportunity away. We pray this in Jesus' name.